Well, hello and welcome to GCA Studios brought to you by Game Change Agency. My name is Jay Taylor and I'll be your host. My guest today is Jim Deloach, who's Managing Director with Protivity. Protivity is a global consulting firm that delivers deep expertise and objective insights to help leaders more confidently address uncertainty and face the future. Jim has more than 35 years of experience and is focused on helping organizations succeed in their responses to things like shareholder demands, government mandates, and a rapidly changing business environment. Jim earned his MBA from the University of North Texas and is a certified public accountant. He's authored several books and hundreds of articles covering topics such as risk management, compliance, internal audit, Sarbanes-Oxley, and many other topics. He's regularly sought out for his thought leadership and recently served on the advisory council for the COSO Enterprise Risk Management Project, which was published last year by the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations. Jim was recently named to the Directorship 100 list by, by the National Association of Corporate Directors. This is an annual prestigious recognition of the most influential people in the boardroom community. Amazingly, this is the sixth year that Jim's been selected for this honor. So, Jim, welcome to GCA Studios. Let's start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and then how you became involved in creating this thought leadership around risk management and its link, linkage to business performance. Well, thank you, Jay, uh, for having me. Uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, you know, my journey, Jay, started 25 years ago. Uh, I was a partner with Anderson. Uh, I've been doing a lot of different things, and I was given a task to address the role of business controls in the age of corporate reengineering and continuous improvement. And kind of a little backdrop, this was in the early 90s. And uh, the, there have been, uh, there was a lot of buzz around the relevance uh, or irrelevance of internal control. And that may be a hard thing for people today to, to understand, but uh, to give you some background, there was the total quality management movement in the 80s, which was the response of uh, companies in the United States and Europe in addressing Jap the, the uh, uh, Japanese competitors who were able to produce quality, high quality products at competitive prices. Mm -hmm. uh, they had to do something. And so there was a lot of emphasis on building quality into processes and uh, as opposed to inspecting it in, which was a high cost, driving the high cost of uh, processes. And then there was the corporate reengineering buzz that was starting at the turn of that decade. And Hammer had just written his book, had a seminal article in the Harvard Business Review. And if you read Hammer, Hammer's book and looked up mm -hmm. Where he talked about internal control, it was in one place. And basically, he said control should be deferred. I attended conferences where people would say, I wish we could figure out another word for control. We should be controlling people or controlling anything. We should be empowering people. I understood it was well-intentioned, but it was a very confusing buzz about internal control. Therefore, I was given this task. Another thing is that it, COSO had just published its uh, internal control integrated framework. That was the 1992 version. It just came out. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of confusion around what it was, what it was intended for. Some people called it a solution in search of a problem. So <laughs> that was the issue that, uh, and the challenge. And so as I studied the problem, I realized it needed an edge. And the edge was risk. And so we created a comprehensive risk language. We called it the business risk model. I got the idea from the Federal Reserve uh, and, and from J.P. Morgan. They had a language of about six risks, 67 risks. And I was mm -hmm. thinking, what if we created a common risk language that we could apply and, and tailor to different industries? And so... We did that, and that led to a book that, went, that uh, I published in, in the mid-90s, an integrated approach to business risk management. And mm -hmm. the idea was to move from a silo, fragmented approach to a more integrated approach. And there were three basic method points, a common risk language, uh, an effective risk oversight structure, and a process view around identifying 
sourcing, measuring, evaluating, managing, and monitoring risk. And so that was where we were in the mid-90s. I didn't feel comfortable that we were quite where we needed to be because there was still high detail orientation around financial, operational, and compliance uh, risk. And so it needed to have an elevation to more of a strategic level. And so I interviewed uh, over 100 executives in North America and in Europe. Hmm. And, and based on that and the work we were doing at Anderson, I uh, wrote a book called Enterprise-Wide Risk Management, Linking Risk and Opportunity, Strategy for Linking Risk and Opportunity. And that hmm. kind of was where my journey started. And it led me to where, you know, over the last 15 years, uh, to focus on elevating the line of sight for risk management to a strategic level with emphasis on integrating risk with strategy and performance. Mm -hmm. Great. I remember the old days of, uh, you know, focusing on the financial risk, and it was a huge improvement to move into the business process and the operations, but taking it to the strategic levels where we really made the most different difference when I was in the internal audit area. So I want to take your thoughts now on the linkage with the business performance. So at a 30,000 foot level, how should a board be thinking about risk oversight and its linkage to business performance so that they can help their company grow and succeed? How common is it really for boards to provide this kind of oversight uh, today? Well, you know, they know it's important, Jay. Um, you know, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, the SEC required board to make disclosure of their risk of the nature of their risk oversight process and to articulate mm -hmm. how they were organizing themselves for risk oversight. And that really sharpened the focus for a lot of boards. And that, you know, boards know it's important. But what's interesting, the most recent public company corporate governance survey that was published by the National Association of Corporate Directors mm -hmm. indicated, Jay, four areas of that required the most improvement. Uh, the first one was recognizing opportunities and risk affecting um, uh, performance. And the second one was uh, monitoring strategic execution. The third one was engaging the board being engaged in the formulation of strategy. And the last one was board risk oversight. So I think at a 30,000 foot level, Jay, that's a pretty good start for any board, whether it's public, private, or not for profit, to focus on those four areas. Uh, as suggested in that survey. Mm -hmm. Those are clearly some of the most important things that a board does. You've been a proponent for integrating risk with strategy setting, also with business planning and then managing overall company performance. What resources are available? If I'm a board member and I want to understand these concepts and these linkages, what kind of resources might be available to help me do that? Well, you know, that's very interesting because when you, I'm sure as you have found out as well, uh, when I talk with directors, I ask them, what do you like? And they say, well, I like stuff that's concise. I like stuff that's crisp mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, something that is to the point. And what they often also say, I particularly like material written by active directors I or see. active directors. So, mm -hmm. you know, with that in mind, I think the best thing out there, Jay, is, is uh, it's about eight years old, nine years old, I guess, getting there. But it's still as relevant today as it was back then. And that's the National Association of Corporate Directors, uh, NACD Blue Ribbon Commission Report issued in oh. 2009. And you, you know that we know what I'm talking about. Yeah, absolutely, it's, uh, yeah. It's entitled Risk Governance, Balancing Risk and Reward. And it, it's, it's filled with sage advice on how to organize the risk oversight. It's got principles in it that are, uh, are, ti are timeless. They're just as relevant today as they were back then. I could give you a couple of examples uh, for our listeners. Uh, the first two principles, uh, one was the, uh, one is the understand the key success factors to 
a company success. And the second one is assess the risk inherent in the strategy. And so you look at those two principles, they're timeless because they, they give a board a very effective context for conducting its risk oversight. So I strongly recommend uh, that uh, that publication by the NACD uh, is very relevant. The second point I would suggest is the PBI Protivity Board Risk Oversight Meeting. Uh, Protivity collaborated with the Board Institute to, to create a, a very easy to use tool to help boards facilitate and make more robust their self-assessment of their risk oversight process. Um, this is something that, um, you know, if you look at those 10 principles that the NACD set forth, one of them, and I think it's the number, the last one, it talks about the importance of continuously assessing the effectiveness of your risk oversight process. And of course, it's a best practice to, uh, self-assess board effectiveness. And, you know, the board as a whole, individual committees and individual members of the board. And risk oversight is no exception to that. And this tool uh, is, can be very effective um, uh, in helping boards self-assess their risk oversight process. It's aligned with how a lot of directors like to do self-assessment, identifies areas where the board is strongest in, areas where the board might want to talk about opportunity to improve. To find it, you go, just Google the Board Institute and look, uh, get on the, that website, look under the Products tab, and you'll find the TBI, Protivity Board Risk Oversight Meeting. And Protivity, that my firm does not receive any compensation when a board decides to use that tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so even, uh in 2009, uh, the NACD and the Protivity TBI tool identified the self-assessment, which is so important, is much, it's a very hot topic today. Um, that nice guidance point. may not touch on some of the, today's hot topics around, you know, culture or, um, you know, cyber risk oversight, but the principles are there. And if you do a continuous assessment, as things change, you're gonna be on top of all of the risks for your organization as a board. Absolutely. Really important. So you served on the COSO ERM Advisory Council where some, I think, really terrific guidance was developed to, to help to promote integration of risk into both planning and decision making. So what are some of the first steps that organizations should take if they want to move along that line and toward the COSO principles? And what can boards do to help accelerate that adoption? Well, you know, I think that one way of looking at this is thinking about kind of where we are in our current state. So in the aftermath of the financial crisis and companies started focusing more on risk and boards started focusing on their risk oversight, mm -hmm. I think most companies started boiling it all down to addressing three questions. What are our risks? How are we managing them, and what you know? How do we know? And so that's kind of the current state. And the question you gotta ask is that really enough? And and given the pace of change today, and so the Coso framework has come out, and Coso, the Coso board is, and PC, PwC are to be congratulated for an outstanding job on that. And privilege to work on the COSO Advisory Council with the board and with PwC. But mm -hmm. they came out and with a with a with this framework and my advice, I have two suggestions to management and one suggestion for board if they start using this framework. And of course the ISO just is coming out with a or, or has just come out with a risk framework. And so whatever framework mm -hmm. a company decides to use there are two things I think management should do. One is to position the organization as an early mover. That means to be an early mover, you've got to be able to recognize 
market opportunities and emerging risk on a timely basis. If you don't, if you can't, it's game over. Mm -hmm. And so, but that's just half the battle. To be an early mover, once you have knowledge of market opportunities and emerging risk, you gotta act on that knowledge. If you don't, and it's a serious matter, it's game over. So those two aspects of being an early mover are very important. The other aspect um, suggestion I would have for management is to improve risk reporting. I think the three questions I outlined as part of the current state, they're fine. Got no problem with them. They're great. God bless those who pursue those questions. But there are three questions that I think are highly germane to effective risk reporting. And they are that, you know, answering the question, are we riskier today than we were yesterday? Okay. Are we entering a riskier time? And why? And so I think that, it, you know, those three questions create more actionable. If you can answer those three questions, uh, you, you have more actionable information for decision making, and your decisions will be more risk informed. Mm -hmm. If you don't, if you're unable to answer those three questions, you won't have actionable information for decision making, and your decision making won't be risk informed. So those are my two suggestions for management. Um, the suggestions I have, uh, one suggestion I have for board, Jay, is to encourage management when using these risk frameworks to position the company to be an early mover mm -hmm. and to encourage management to improve its risk reporting. And to that point, you know, boards may get lots of fancy reports at board meetings, lots of graphs, risk maps, heat maps, and all that stuff. It's great. But they ought to ask, how much manual effort is required to produce all this stuff? And if you've got a lot of manual effort underneath the covers and behind the scenes to produce this stuff, what does that say about your ability to have near real-time information in the hands of decision makers? It doesn't speak well to that. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a couple of different frameworks, and the important thing is to pick one, be an early adopter, and move with it. So whether it's COSO, whether it's ISO, the point is to have some kind of a framework that the board and leadership can trust and get behind and, and under, understand and, frankly, be able to implement it. So, okay. So last fall, you wrote an article. It was very interesting. It talked about the importance of companies being properly positioned to face the future confidently. I found that uh, word to be particularly interesting. In particular, you said that a confident organization routinely identifies the risks that are rising from, as well as the risks to executing the strategy. This is gonna help ensure that the most critical exposures are managed effectively. Can you elaborate just a bit more on that? How does this type of focus help boards drive performance and be more confident about the future? Well, you know, to, to uh, the reference to uh, Faith in the future with confidence. Um, you know that's a mm -hmm. that's the productivity tagline, and we we like to think we're in business to help companies face the future with confidence. And there are various attribute, various attributes to facing the future with confidence, and we've written about those. This is you're talking about one of those attributes, and that's you know undertaking risk um, and being a, an effective risk taker. And you know I. Uh, one article I wrote, uh, giving an example of that, was it referred to Walt Disney. Mm -hmm. And when you study the life of Walt Disney, it's amazing. Uh, the man was the consummate risk taker. Mm. Uh, he took big risk. He made big bets. And it's a fascinating uh, life experience uh, to read about. Um, but when you think about risk and, and, and taking risk and doing it with confidence, the COSO framework, Jay, came out with a suggestion that there's three aspects of integrating risk with strategy. And, you know, the first one is very common, and that is to assess, um, to, to 
uh, focused on monitoring and managing the risk to the execution of the strategy. And that's very common. A lot of companies, are you know, when they start trying to elevate their line of sight on risk to strategy, that's where they focus, you know, mm-hmm. on the execution, the risk to the execution of the strategy. There are, however, two other dimensions that Kelso recommends. And what is the risk from the strategy? So when you're looking at different risk alternatives, risk uh, options, different strategic options, uh, there are different risk. There may be different risk profiles that mm-hmm. are associated with each of those options. So you, we should understand the risk reward balance uh, with respect to each of those strategic alternatives. So that's the risk from the strategy. The other aspect, the dimension of of, of that Coso mentioned was the alignment, the risk of the alignment of that the strategy is not effectively aligned with the organization's mission, vision, and values. And mm-hmm. to, getting back to Walt Disney, he made big bets, mm-hmm. but they were inextricably linked to his mission his vision, you know, his core values, inextricably like directionally, he was going where he wanted to go. And those, that's the reason why he made those bets. He could make the business case for those bets to his board. Uh, and they supported those bets. So I think those are three dimensions of integrating risk with strategy. And when you do that, then you have the risk appetite dialogue between management and the board, getting on the same page into the risk we're willing to accept, the risk we want to avoid, and the strategic, financial, and operational parameters within which we want to operate. Mm-hmm. When we have that understanding, we can drive that down into the organization with risk tolerances that are linked to performance objectives. So this is, you know, from a risk perspective, this is how we get the board, the CEO, and his or her executive team can get confident that the organization is taking risk on an informed basis and operating within the parameters of that risk appetite. And alignment is what engenders confidence. Alignment of the strategy to mission, vision, and core values, and alignment of the Mm -hmm. Uh, organization, its processes, and people with the strategy, that engenders confidence. It's that alignment that's so critical. In one of the articles you published last month, Jim, you talked about, I think it was 10 ways to enhance leadership engagement, and the purpose was to help executive management and the board remain engaged and aligned over time, which you just touched on. When these leaders consider the impact of external changes on their business, you suggested that they focus on critical assumptions that underlie the corporate strategy. This is going to allow them to assess the strategic risks and deal with that uncertainty we've been talking about. And then to test the assumptions, you mentioned things like scenario planning as a technique to expose risk and the upside, the opportunity piece. Give me an example of using scenarios around business strategy. And are there other techniques that uh, organizations should be uh, considering or applying to strengthen their planning and achieve their objectives? Sure. Um, you know, I think that scenario analysis is, is where we are combining the, what we know with, with what we don't know and the object, with the objective of, of articulating some internally consistent views of the future, some of them plausible, some of them extreme. Mm-hmm. So that we can reality check some of our assumptions and expectations underlying our strategy, mm-hmm. address what if questions that we might have, or test the sensitivity of environmental factors that could potentially impact our strategy and maybe warrant monitoring over time. So I think there are a lot of examples, you know, um, mm-hmm. uh, scenarios. Uh, developed around and focused on commodity price changes and commodity prices, interest rate uh, changes. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody kind of 
up in arms about what the Fed's going to do. They're going to raise rates three times. It's pretty much what they're going to mm-hmm. say. But the market just absolutely tanked a few weeks ago in fear that the Fed might increase rates uh, more than three times. So, you know, that maybe is a signal that we ought to assess, do stress testing around what's our sensitivity to interest rates um, being increased. Um, but also uh, around supply chain disruption, uh, geopolitical events. I'll give you one mm-hmm. specific example. Um, a foreign manufacturer that when Donald Trump was elected president, their, their board, their chairman of the board asked the management team to assess uh, different scenarios dependent on, you know, what the president elect's new administration might do with respect mm-hmm. to following up on the president elect's campaign promises around altering trade relationships and exiting trade mm-hmm. packs and, you know, uh, holding certain countries to account and so forth and so on. And this was not looking for a risk of an Armageddon. The chairman Mm -hmm. was this was looking for opportunities. Will there be market opportunities that we can focus on? And so Mm -hmm. uh, this is a good illustration because it illustrates some of the attributes of effective scenario planning, scenario analysis. It had top management support. This was at the very top. Um, it uh, was measurable because it was focused on the, the current business plan and, and what impact it might have on the business plan. It was actionable and realistic because it dealt with not some hypothetical scenario, mm-hmm. something that was very, very real that everyone could relate to and understand. And it was time bound, meaning it we're looking at the potential implications of the business plan for the planning horizon that that business plan covered. So that's a great example. I think that um, contrarian analysis is another technique. Mm-hmm. At, and and the, how realistic your strategic assumptions are and assessing what factors in the external environment might impact those assumptions that would cause you to have to go back and revisit your strategy. Mm-hmm. So we've talked about scenario planning and some other things. The organization I came from, we used uh, war gaming, game theory. Yep. And then when it came to scenario planning, what we did is we would take the, we called it the medium term plan, the three year plan, if you would. And we work with the, uh, the business planning people, but also the chief economists and others to come up with scenarios. So we developed 10 scenarios to apply against the medium term plan. And what was interesting about that, it included some of the things you talked about around interest rates, geopolitical, you know, what's going to happen in Russia? What happens if the Brazil-Mexico trade agreement uh, is altered? What happens if there's a slowdown in China? What ha- you know, those kind of things. What was interesting is that when we did a look back a year later, even though that we assessed the probabilities of these things occurring to only be 20%, uh, seven of the 10 had occurred. That's how much change was going on globally around the, the company. And the good thing is that we were prepared. Since we had identified these risks, we were prepared to take action uh, should they occur. And so we were still able to meet the business plan and all those kinds of things. So that's the value of risk management that some people do not really understand. And using scenarios and other kinds of techniques are really the effective way to get those issues on the table. I, I, I agree completely. I agree completely. I, I think what's interesting about game theory is that it, you know, it, 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 it's really coming out of the military area and it's really getting more ingrained in business now. Mm-hmm. And so I think it, it, it's, uh, uh, we're seeing a lot more of that. Mm-hmm. And the chairman of our risk committee, we would talk about with him about, um, he called them after action reviews because he had actually come out of the Navy. And uh, we called him uh, something else, but uh, in the Japan crisis, for example, with the tsunami, uh, you know, we did a look back to see uh, what could we have done better? How could we be better prepared next time? So they, like you said, the military that was deals a game with- game changer, wasn't it? That was yeah. a game changer, for sure. It really was. A lot of lessons <laughs> there. 
So one of the things I'm interested in, Jim, is helping boards and senior leaders think differently about risk and how to turn that into opportunity, because that's what it's all about. Uh, in the 2018 risk study you co-authored co with um, North Carolina State University, the number one risk that came out of that dealt with the speed of disruption, the speed of innovation change, and new technology adoption. Some say the U.S. is actually entering a new period of renaissance around technology change right now, which will make it extremely important for companies to stay on top of this. So what steps should boards take to ensure that the senior executives are paying attention, enough attention to this? Well, I, I certainly agree that uh, we're certainly seeing uh, a renaissance here in, in the United States. Um, you know, we, it seems like the technology is taking us all for a ride, and, and it's not only impacting developed countries, it's impacting developing and undeveloped countries as well. So it's really um, helping to elevate many, many things so they can all be done better. I think what's interesting about digital innovation is that the pace of change is so rapid. It, it, it's it's putting so much of pressure on traditional business models. So that the half-life of business models is constantly compressing uh, over time. We're not just talking about, when we talk about digital, we're not just talking about embracing a few software apps and tools. We're not even talking about having a digital strategy. What we're really talking about is position, you know, Positioning the organization to act and think digitally. And that's, that's, that's what we're really talking about. So from a board perspective, I think one thing the board needs to do is look at its composition. And, you know, does it have the right expertise sitting around that table that can enable it to effectively oversee uh, digital, digital innovation? Uh, if not, is it make availing itself to objective advisors who can advise the board on some of the potential opportunities and, and issues that are relevant to the organization? Uh -huh. Another aspect uh, would be digital readiness. Where is the organization on the digital maturity continuum? Hmm. So is it a leader or is it a follower? <clears throat> Nothing wrong with being a follower. There are a lot of successful companies that can be followers. But to be a follower, you've got to be agile. You've got to be resilient. You've got to be an early mover. You can't, you know, just sit back. Um, so <clears throat> are you a digital leader or are you an agile follower? By contrast, are you a digital skeptic or are you a digital beginner? And so where is the organization on the digital maturity continuum? And more importantly, from a board and executive management standpoint, where should it be? Another aspect would be innovation velocity. Uh, Jeff Bezos had a fascinating letter to Amazon shareholders in the 2016 annual report. He issued this last April of 2017 in which he talked about decision velocity. And here, here's the CEO of Amazon talking about this. I mean, I think, you know, it's kind of like the old commercial when somebody speaks, everybody should listen. And, and <laughs> he's talking about uh, decision velocity. And so how quickly is an organization taking digital concepts like speech recognition, machine learning, artificial intelligence, robotics, visualization techniques, the ever-expanding mm -hmm. power of mobile, taking these and other digital concepts and using them to reimagine uh, key operating processes and key functions such as finance, information technology, and procurement. So how quickly are we doing this? Are we quick, are we quick enough? Are we making decisions at the speed a business. Uh, that's, that's the bottom line. Um, a fourth factor is talent. Do we have the right talent to move us to where we want to be on the digital 
maturity continuum. And nothing, you know, I, it's great to think about how we're going to empower our existing organization to, you know, uh, think and act digitally. But uh, there could be a hybrid model that needs to be thought about of bringing digital talent into the organization that can come at this and look at this objectively. Because we can't be, you know, there can't be any reticence. We got to move. We got to we got to move at the speed of business. So we may need some infusion of talent to go along with the powerful institutional memory of the existing uh, workforce. And then finally, barriers. You know, you got to deal ruthlessly with barriers through a change management process. So that's a starter. I mean, you focus on these areas of, uh, of uh, composition, uh, readiness, information, you know, decision, velocity, uh, talent, and barriers. And from the standpoint of the board, Jay, management had better get this right. The hyperscalability of digital business models and the lack of entry barriers are enabling new competitors uh, to enter the market and scale quickly uh, and 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 redefine and reimagine the customer experience. So established incumbents are looking at, I mean, if one thing, you know, to be, you know, not see it coming, but, you know, if the other thing to react on a, on a timely basis, uh, dealing with a company that's born digital. So it's talent not only in the leadership of the organization, but it sounds like talent on the board and when you're, you're pointing a little bit earlier about uh, the self-assessment, you know, these board members need to get out and find out what's going on uh, with associated with technology as well. I thought NACD took a great step uh, this year bringing board members to the, um, uh, the CES in uh, Las Vegas, taking them through some of the new technology and, uh, you know, exposing them to things that they normally wouldn't be exposed to. But board members can't rely on organizations like NACD to do it for them. They've got to get out and do it themselves. Right. The disruption is just so great. I know just recently my wife and I, you know, sold our home in less than 48 hours without using a real estate agent. And so, the, the, you know, talk about disruption. Somebody lost a very, very big commission on that one. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Jim, in December, uh, you published an article on the five key principles around effective risk management. And you discussed the importance of encouraging and reinforcing the desired behaviors, including risk behavior. And I wanted to focus on this because this is so important in the company that I uh, was with recently. And uh, the CEO really led the effort around changing behaviors in the company. Part of the solution involved having appropriate incentives that are aligned to the values, culture, and performance so that the wrong behaviors are not being rewarded. And you know, what should the board's role be in this, and how can they identify where incentives and risk culture might be misaligned? You know, it's really tough. And um, when, you, when you think about, when you see reputation harm being done to a proud brand. You know, sometimes we read these stories and they're on the far right hand column or the front page of the Wall Street Journal or they're in Fortune and Forbes or what have you and we shake our heads and we ask what were they thinking. Um, we Sometimes we ask ourselves questions, what did they know and when did they know it and ultimately those questions are directed to the board, you know. You know, and it's, it's sad, but it's true. It often, that often that it's not unusual for the root causes of reputation harm uh, to be uh, made aware, the board becomes aware of it when it's just too late. Yeah. Part of the reason is that some of these reputation damaging events, they're spawned by decisions that were made many years ago earlier. And, and the velocity is very slow in terms of, of, you know, the effects of those decisions. And, 
you know, I, you, you, you know, with your background at GM, I'm, I'm always fascinated by when Mary Barrow, you know, became CEO. And here, she's a lifer, and uh, she's been at all, all over GM. Uh, and she got hit by the ignition switch thing. And I, I greatly admired how she dealt with that. It was not the traditional, let's get this thing over with, let's sweep this under the rug, let's circle the wagon. I, I, she set an example for corporate America to be open, transparent, we're going to find out the truth, we're going to get this done. And then I read in, in, in Fortune uh, just the other day, she told employees in a town hall that we're never going to forget this. Mm -hmm. It's something we are always going to remember, and it, it it brings up a couple of rules, you know, that are you know, I think are paramount here. But you know, the stakeholder rule and the sunlight rule. The stakeholder rule: when you make critical decisions, pretend that your stakeholders are in the room with you, so you can be proud of your decision-making process. The sunlight rule, don't ever make a decision that when the sunlight shines on it, when the consequences occur from it, that it's going to force you into damage control. And so, you know, that's implicit in what Ms. Barrows is really trying to bring to the, that culture. And I wish more CEOs would focus like that. And from a board perspective, I think it, it points to two things, culture and focus. And culture... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, people say, gosh, it's a soft thing. Uh, how do we deal with it? But, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, it deals a lot with internal pressures, internal pressures that, you know, can drive and create manage unmanageable bias, uh, uh, flawed decisions, um, uh, responsible or illegal behavior. And, and, this, these pressures, there's pressure in every organization. Let's face it, you know, it's not easy being a business. It's not easy running a business. But what we're talking about are, are, are pressures that are spawned by unrealistic performance targets, uh, conflicting business objectives, disruptive change that alters fundamentals in the business model, or imbalances between uh, the compensation given for short-term performance and the long-term interest of stakeholders. So a board got to do something about this. It needs to focus on looking at things like, you know, if, if the CEO really want to know the truth? Mary Barrows wanted to know the truth. Whatever it was, and she was open arms about sharing whatever the truth was. She wanted it all transparent. Do you have a CEO that has that quality? Wants to know the unvarnished truth because you can't improve a process. You can't improve decision making unless the CEO is committed to knowing the truth. So is the board comfortable that the CEO wants the unvarnished truth? Uh, his tone at the top, which you often see talked about, that's great. But is the tone in the middle, the mood in the middle, aligned with that tone at the top? Because the tone in the middle sets the tone at the bottom, the buzz at the bottom. So the tone at the top, the tone in the middle need to be aligned to create an effective tone of the organization. Uh, you know, I mean, in turn, you know, it comes down to connecting the dots, looking for patterns. Mm -hmm. One of my colleagues uh, here at Protivity, he meets with boards, uh, met, he, he probably meets with more boards than anybody else in Fertility. Mm -hmm. uh, and culture is a big deal with boards. And he's developed his own opinion that boards have to have an intellectual curiosity. You know, to probe deeper if they don't understand something. Probe deeper if it's, something doesn't make sense. And to expect internal audit to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, and finally, engaging in and getting back to the CEOs uh, willing to accept the unvarnished truth, uh, getting back to the point of 
the CEO um, being willing to engage in, in having external uh, anonymous surveys that mm -hmm. will spill, everybody can spill their guts out because they're protected <laughs> through anonymity and confidentiality and if your baby is ugly, <laughs> your employees will tell you your baby is ugly. Yes, they will. They are confident that their uh, views are confidential and anonymous. And more importantly, the CEO has to look the organization in the eye and say, I want to know the truth. And we are committed as an executive team to make the necessary uh, improvements that you that that come out of this survey so you know glass door um uh engaging in the best places to work surveys um mm -hmm. you know that tells an executive team a lot that culture focus is another area it's hard to get make sure that performance incentives are fully aligned uh, if you, but you know, how do you get focused on that? And you know, this the, uh, the job of the compensation committee, and yet you know, you still see issues. So there are a number of areas. So you can start focusing where uh, on business units that carry a disproportionate amount of the risk in the overall risk profile or. or business units that are more significantly profitable than other business units, or business units that take unusual risk in relation to other business units, like unusual environmental health and safety risk, or business units that compensated people differently. For example, they compensate their people on the completion of a specific act, whereas the revenue and the risk associated with that completed act carry on into the future. So loan origination is an example of that. If you compensate people based on originating loans, what do they care about in terms of the quality of those loans, whether the underwriting standards are met, whether their collateral is worth anything, what do they care? They're getting compensated. Let everybody else worry about the rest of the problems. So those are that culture and focus has got to be the order of the day on this very, very challenging problem. Mm -hmm. You mentioned surveys as a technique to find out how, how ugly the baby is, using your words, and uh, kind of matching that or aligning that with the most uh, risky areas of the business to see, do you have a problem with people not being comfortable, you know, getting issues on the table? Do they feel like they can, uh, they've got the information to see around the corner and what's coming next? Um, you know, do they feel like they can um, address things and that they're getting the proper respect from their, their supervisor, for example? And you mentioned no, Mary no, Jay, to that point, to that, that point, Jack Welch wrote a very interesting shareholder letter in the latter years of his tenure. And mm -hmm. one of the topics he wrote, he talked about, there's two ways that you get fired at G. <laughs> And one way is, you know, we rank and yank and all that stuff like everybody else. But the other way, we, he said, we are very demanding of our people. But you get fired here if you commit an ethical violation. Hmm. And so, yeah, we're demanding, but we expect people to operate and function within ethical bounds um, and by implication, legal bounds. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's, that, that balance is something that executives and boards need to be concerned with. So I agree with you. Mm -hmm. And to your point earlier about alignment with the, the compensation and other kinds of incentives, uh, the company I came from, I was asked by our board and our senior leaders to take a look at the executive compensation plan and identify for the board whether we thought that uh, from our strategic risk management perspective, if we thought there were things in there that would uh, drive the wrong behaviors. So the company's very, very interested in doing that kind of thing. Jim, my last question here, uh, you know, about 18 months ago, you and I co-presented at a conference for chief compliance officers. And what we wanted to do was to help them elevate their game, to help them, you know, they want to get a seat at the table. And uh, we thought that they could uh, maybe move in that direction by better engagement around risk oversight, for example. 
In many organizations, chief risk officers are still reporting below the C-suite and they're struggling also to become more relevant. What advice would you have to help these chief risk officers to elevate their game? And what do directors on the board level want and need from chief risk officers? Yeah, we had a good time. I had a good time um, sitting side by side with you uh, in that uh, session um, that we did a few years ago. I, I think that, you know, there are several things that I think it's very important to a board. You know, I make an observation. Uh, Peter Uberoth, um, he was the Olympic guy, you know, LA Olympics. He, made a, he, he served on a number of audit committees, <clears throat> and I was at a conference year, many years ago, and he made an observation about, you know, making people work for you, you know, and mm -hmm. the CRO is definitely in a position to assist a board, and particularly inform its, its risk oversight, but the board's got to make sure that CEO is positioned for success. And so you start with, you know, defining expectations. Is the board, <clears throat> is the CRO uh, a champion or is the CRO a viable line of defense? I mean, a champion, is, it does great things, facilitate the, uh, the, the execution of a framework within the organization, does a lot of coordination, does a lot of education, uh, assist people with reporting, all these great things. They're wonderful things. But a champion has some teeth, some escalatory and sometimes some veto authority teeth. And so uh, by, by reference, the champion can have access uh, to the board or access to the CEO. That teeth is extremely important if you want a, a line of defense. And then a second point is making sure that the culture of the organization emphasizes the everyone is responsible mantra. So looking at the traditional lines of defense model, uh, your, your, your business unit owners and process owners and functional leaders, they should own the risk that their respective activities excuse me, create. And um, that is, that is, if that doesn't exist, a CRO, a CRO's job is almost impossible. You know, I mean, if nobody mm -hmm. cares, uh, it's very, very difficult. Now the CRO can partner with these first line of defense individuals and units and functions. And, and, and partner with them in terms of coming up with the best approach and managing the risk that their activities uh, create, all in the context mm -hmm. of the business plan. And then uh, positioning the CRO appropriately within the organization, to report directly to the board, have access to the CEO, uh, that's extremely important. The CRO can also do something. The CRO can think more strategically. Uh, the CRO can focus more um, in terms of linking opportunity and risk and dialoguing with people throughout the organization and the CRO can uh, focus on maximizing the effectiveness of board communication. All told, the CRO properly positioned can really help the board inform its risk oversight. Mm -hmm. And so whether you're going into a um new geography with new business, you're going to turn around catalog, you're going to do X, Y, Z, you know, having that risk perspective and um, the linkage to the business strategy uh, really helps people make better decisions. And exactly. uh, that's where the value is, in my opinion. Exactly. Well, Jim, I want to thank you for your time today. It's been great. Uh, but before we go, is there anything that I may have missed that you'd like to mention to the, the, the audience here? Well, well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Jay. Uh, this is a uh, it's been I've enjoyed the conversation. I always enjoy whatever time we are able, whenever we're able to spend time together. Uh, you know, I would just suggest two things. One is um, that 
when you look at the COSO framework, when you look at the ISO framework, when you look at all these different frameworks, uh, whatever they are, just make sure that your organization focuses on four things. Uh, the focus on integrating risk with strategy, integrating mm -hmm. risk with performance, integrating risk with decision making, mm -hmm. uh, and building a strong risk governance and culture. Those four things, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like going back to the movie. One thing, you know, just one thing, everything else, not that important, but those four things, kind of focus on those four things. Use these frameworks to help you advance your game in dealing with those four things. The other thing I would suggest, I, I posed three questions in the contemporary view of risk management. And I kind of see that, see, we're kind of bogged down into risk listing, mm -hmm. you know, listing risk. And I, I call that enterprise list management. You know, we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're listing risk. And while that's great, has dialogue, I think the, the question we got to ask today, do we or do we not have risk-informed decision-making across this organization? Because that's the game now. Mm -hmm. we got to make decisions. We're going to increase information velocity. Are we informing those decisions? Uh, are, we, are we really creating a risk-informed culture, a risk-informed decision-making culture within our organization? Risk listing, that's an analog solution that was developed in the 1990s. We have the 21st century here, and we have a myriad of digital concepts and tools that are being used to reimagine processes and functions. Why not also reimagining risk management to put information in the hands, you know, of decision makers near real time? Why not? It's possible. It's feasible. We're doing it at Protivity and helping companies. So that would be my challenge that I would leave our guest on your broadcast. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to spend some time talking about enhancing corporate strategy confidence by integrating performance, risk, and incentives. You've knocked it out of the ballpark. I really appreciate your time today, Jim. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jay. Take good care. We'll Bye -bye. see you.